Good morning, everyone. I'm Linus. And I'm Sam. Um, <laughs> and that's us. Yeah, so uh, we re we've managed the, well, I've managed the past two releases. You're yeah, and this is my uh, first release I've managed, and I'll be also uh, managing um, uh, 2003 coming up here. So, yeah, here's our talk. Yeah, so first of all, we'll start, um, start by telling you a bit about the timeline. Um, at the last NixCon, I volunteered as a release manager for 1903. Um, and was summarily announced as the release manager for 1903. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, and I uh, expressed some interest at some point in the future, I might have an interest in being a release manager. It was kind of a tough decision because uh, I had a baby in June. So <laughs> we'll get back to that later. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I just sort of forgot about it, and in June, I asked you if you were still interested. And I said, uh, I just had a baby, but <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, so then I announced that Sam would be my co-release manager for 1909. And we had a meeting where we agreed we would meet up every week to talk about the release. Yeah, every week we were going to talk about the release. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, yeah, I uh, submitted the um, announcement, uh, basically announcing the schedule of what we we're going to do. And I said, since it's late, we have to choose between a shorter notice branch off and a shortened stabilization period. So actually, Linus uh, was the one that pointed that out. And I said, well, let's just shorten the stabilization period. It can't be that bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we planned the branch off for uh, uh, September 7th. And uh, then we actually re uh, did the branch off on the 9th. So that was actually Which isn't too bad. horrible, <laughs> but it was definitely late. And then we get to the end of uh, September, and we kind of start getting a little stressed. It's like, oh, we haven't released yet. What, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and so then we're at the end of uh, September, and we uh, are getting stressed. And then early October and whatnot, we start panicking a little bit. But on the 39th of September, we do manage to get the release out. <laughs> <laughs> um, which leads us up to NixCon. Um, yeah, so I started preparing this on Monday, and um, we actually prepared this just now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like what? Uh, twenty? Le yeah, about more 20 details minutes on this. Ago, we on started the uh, getting this thing together. There's a good reason for this. Okay, <laughs> I, I promise I have an excuse. Um, but yeah, so there are s actually some things that we can learn from it. Um. Yeah, so <laughs> living in the same time zone, it's really difficult scheduling meetings, especially when both people are working full-time jobs, to uh, actually get together and have the meetings. It's like, oh, it, I got to get up at 7 a.m. for a meeting, and then there's a client that he has to meet at 7 a.m., so we have to push the meeting, and yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult being in different time zones. And uh, yeah, uh, don't have babies and be a release manager. It's, it's not a good idea. Uh. <laughs> and the last point is the reason for, um, for this talk being a little more spontaneous than planned. Um, I wanted to generate some wonderful statistics, uh, but GitHub and its rate limits and the slightly fragile Python script I was using to scrape GitHub uh, were not having any of that. Um, but we have some more serious uh, So the one takeaways. thing, yeah, the one thing I would definitely suggest uh, to anyone that's going to be a future release manager, really do meet up regularly. It's, it's difficult to find the time to do it, but definitely our most productive times were when we were together talking and uh, he was coaching me through the processes that needed done. Um, 
we definitely found some gaps in documentation um, in some of those meetings and whatnot and uh, things that we can fix for future release management. And um, get the announcements done early. Uh, don't wait to the last minute to get the announcement out. Uh, people aren't going to be mad at you if you uh, say that we're going to have the freeze in two months and whatnot, uh, but they will be pretty mad if you say we're gonna have the freeze in five days. Uh, we did not do that, but uh, we <laughs> came dangerously close to being in a tight situation there. That said, I think um, one thing one thing I noticed is that a lot of things started coming in very last minute before the uh, after the planned feature freeze and before the actual feature freeze. Um, so like GCC eight. <laughs> Um, yeah, just just li little details like that. Um, switching to a new compiler and rebuilding everything. Um, yeah, so uh, try and get features in before the feature freeze is even announced would be nice, but on Especially the other hand... Especially if it's going to rebuild everything and we have to wait a day and a half for Hydra to tell us that it's okay and then find out there's other problems that still need fixed. So Definitely yeah, we need get to get uh, that stuff in early. So we need to keep better track of what's going on, what's happening, and make sure we get that in with some with some breathing space before feature freeze. And then yeah, one of the things we would suggest is uh, maybe have an RFC process around the zero hydra failures and how we actually deal with. Um, the failures that come up at the end of the release cycle and how to get them resolved and whatnot. So currently we open an issue, we list all the things and we say go hack on it. And then after uh, everyone fixes as many as they can, we mark everything as broken that's remaining. Um, some of those don't get backported properly. So then people are like, wait, why, th why is this being marked broken? I fix this. Other things, um, automating marking things broken is really hard when you're dealing with multiple Python versions. Um, and it's really only broken for Python 2 and you accidentally ma mark it broken for both Python versions. So uh, we might want to add some more um, time to discuss um, as a community, not just the release managers, but as a whole community, how we handle the zero hydra failure process and how we ensure that the work done in the zero hydra failure process gets into the release and doesn't just sit on master waiting for the following release. And spend some more time on the release notes because um, we ended up missing out a few things and adding some after the release and uh, also not optimal. Yeah, and I think <laughs> we didn't review the release notes until like a few hours or days basically before we actually did the release. Yeah, we did it when we were doing the release, yeah. basically. Um, <laughs> it makes sense to do that during the yeah. during the feature freeze. Um, and then um, uh, define how to divide responsibilities. As you can tell, we did this really well for the talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so seriously though, um, as uh, co-release managers and maybe even as we grow into a bigger next community, having more of a release management team. Um, it's very important to uh, define who's doing what. And there were definitely a number of key people that made this release happen um, aside from us and just the general contributions, um, like uh, uh, the um, staging, getting merge back in, and the staging next stuff. Um, uh, Fred H did a lot of that, um, so that was key to it. And maybe what we need to do is define some more roles in the release management team that it's like, okay, I have a specific role. My role is to constantly review the release notes. I have a specific role. My role is to make sure big changes are getting merged back into master um, early and often um, without breaking master all the time. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, I think it's important for us to have more discussions about how we do this release process going forward as a community. That said, um, I do have some statistics that uh, weren't dependent on GitHub and um, I managed to get thanks to my local copy of all the commits. 
Uh, so it'll be definitely commit focused and will not have much on issues or pull requests, unfortunately. But um, we can see we've had a pretty intense increase in commits, um, especially in 2018. Oh, that's um, funky. Uh, <laughs> and 2019 is a bit less, obviously, because the year isn't over yet. But um, I think it's a quite an exciting reflection of how we're growing. I, I think that I think the room we were in in London last year was a bit smaller as well and had a few less people. Um, <laughs> yes, so um, that's nice. Uh, yeah, that reflects reflects the same trend. Um, again, we've ha we've got a bit less for 29 be 2019 because the year's not over yet. Yeah. Um, so uh, commits per year. Um, what? Commit hers <laughs> per year. Um, uh, yeah, so this slide basically shows that we're on a growing trend, and it's nearly exponential um, up until most recently where it's kind of tapered off a little bit. But, um, yeah, I mean, we definitely have more and more people committing every single release, and it's really exciting how fast this community is growing. Also, if you look at the, ac uh, if you look at the access label, you'll see that that's 1,200 for 2018. So um, that's quite a few people. We have a lot of people working on Nix packages. Yeah, and there are still two months left, so if you want to be counted in that number, find a PR to work on, do something to help out, and uh, you'll increase it even higher. And if you've already done so, get a friend to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> Ask a friend if you can commit code to Nix packages in their name. <laughs> Same trend again. Uh, we've got some decreasing percentages, which I think is primarily an artifact of how uh, it's a relative relative measure of growth. And um, I, I I remember a comic or something uh, where someone said, um, "I've just founded a religion. Will you join my religion?" And then pointed out that he. He had a hundred percent growth in his religion. So with our next religion, um, <laughs> we have a slightly smaller growth, um, which is which is in part due to the absolute uh, growth. But yeah, it's nice to see more people. And uh, commits committer per year. Um, so one of the nice trends we see here is um, if you look in 2009, um, the number of commits per committer is rather high, like over 250, which is just unsustainable over the course of a long period of time. And we're actually in a downward trend that's tapering off pretty well um, with the number of commits per committer now. And a huge portion of that is basically because we just have a whole lot more committers um, I don't think it's because people are being more lazy. It's just uh, there's more people to go around to do the work. Um, so it kind of trends off a little bit. Yeah, so it's nice to have the responsibility being more distributed. At least I hope that's what we can interpret from that trend. <laughs> and uh, number of commits per day. Um, I'm guessing this is when the feature branch off was probably. Um, but you can see it's kind of growing up, growing up, and then it just like plummets completely. The drop off is probably because um, that was the day on which we tagged the release. That's why I was wondering. OK, <laughs> so that's the day we tagged the release. That's why the commits dropped down. And so it only goes up to the release tag. OK, mm -hmm. got it. And that's a slightly, uh, yeah, slightly shorter range of time. Um, last 36 months of commits per day. Um, yes, it's a wavy line. And that's all we have in terms of statistics. Yep. So um, I'd like to open the floor kind of to anyone that has any questions about the release process, has uh, any um, uh, 
things they want to add. Yeah. I was, uh, hi, thank you for the release. Um, I have a question about the commits uh, per committer. Do you have any idea of like how many of those are like basically like just one liners as in like updating a version? Uh, we don't have a statistic on that. Um, we could probably get something like that, um, but I think a lot of them tend to not be just one-liners on the big ones. I mean, the ones that are making tons and tons of commits, like I think uh, uh, World of Peace was ranked up there as one of the higher ones. Um, he was working on some pretty intense stuff uh, across like all sorts of different parts, including the standard environment and whatnot. So I don't think it's just people bumping things, especially now that we have the uh, Ryan TM bot basically bumping almost everything. And uh, all those are accredited to one committer now instead of uh, someone that's not a bot getting credit for it. Yeah, as for actual statistics on that, uh, the numbers are there, but I'm not, I don't trust myself to get live coding um, oh. some graphs in Python right. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> I have a question about the zero hydro failure. So when I saw the ticket and progress being made on it, uh, one of the questions I had is, is there a way to search on Hydra to see all of the packages that are failing for which I am listed as a maintainer? That is a good question, and I don't think there is, which is kind of why we have that Python script in the maintainers page that basically pings everyone. Um, and it took us a little while. We didn't get that working quite the day we announced the zero Hydra failures. It wasn't until about a week or two after that when I got that script uh, functioning properly again because of some breaking changes um, that happened with how the maintainers are listed and whatnot. And that is one thing I would definitely suggest as a takeaway as well. Um, getting scripts like that that are important to the release managers um, with some CI tests on them um, because that would be an easy thing to basically check and make sure that the maintainer's structure isn't going to break that script going forward so we know when things are breaking much, much earlier in it. Graham. What was the most rewarding part of being a release manager? Ooh, the most rewarding part of being a release manager. Um, I th think it was probably seeing like how many people came together to fix things and whatnot, uh, especially at the last minute. It would be nice if we didn't have that last minute dash and whatnot, but definitely there's a huge push by people and uh, people work together to make the release come together. It's not just us, it's a whole community that's doing these things. Um, for me, I think it might be the satisfaction of when it's done and I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm free, of the <laughs> free of the pressure. Um, yeah. <laughs> Although I'm very happy to have, uh, to have made the contribution, as Sam said. Um, so yeah, not, not just that. Anyone else? Graham. Yeah, as I mentioned a little earlier, I think, what? Oh, are there wait? <laughs> are, there are there ways we could change the release process, or the contribution process to make releases easier to do? Yes, so as I mentioned earlier, um, having more of a team effort and having like uh, regular team meetings for the people that are involved in doing the release rather than just the two release managers doing things and other people doing their own things and whatnot. Having a more organized effort and whatnot and knowing who's responsible for what pieces of the release. I think that would definitely help the release go a whole lot more smoother. And maybe we might actually hit the release in the same month if we uh, did something like that. And then someone back there had a question. Um, just to add to that answer quickly, I think it would be nice to have notifications for maintainers from Hydra again. Um, yeah, just not spam when the standard end breaks. 
I just wanted to say, um, you know, don't be too humble. Uh, my, my friend reports this is the first release that didn't break his configuration, so congrats. <laughs> Although re releases are for breaking configurations. So <laughs> <laughs> that just means we didn't release enough features, right? <laughs> right, I think that's it. Yep, unless anyone else has any other questions. There's one more. What are the most notable features? The most notable feature by far is GCC 8. Um, also, one feature I'm really liking is the update of systemd. So when your uh, systemd services uh, stop, it tells you a summary of how much network usage and um, CPU usage and memory the service had. Um, adding that new feature to systemd has made my life debugging crashing services so much more fun. Yes? I wanted to make a suggestion about um, the difficulty having weekly meetings, especially across time zones. I'm a big fan of just writing, you know, not necessarily a blog article, but pub public would be good since it's a distributed, uh, yeah, all of us are very distributed and it's nice to know what's happening. And just like writing to each other weekly would probably go a long way to hitting the necessary buckets that uh, having a meeting would hit as well as, you know, making it uh, public. Um. That sounds good. Yeah, that does sound good. Um, I'm horrible at writing things down, but that does sound very good. <laughs> <laughs> and as a closing note, um, I'd like to also thank my employer, Mayflower, for giving me time to work time to spend on the release. Yeah, and IOHK gave me a little bit of time. I didn't have that much because of other things going on and whatnot, so I ended up doing a lot of the release work outside of my normal work day. Um, but a huge thanks to IOHK for letting me spend some time working on Nick's PKG's issues and whatnot. And the whole community. There were so many people who contributed to the release. Remember? That's a lot of people. And uh, one more thing to close out. If you are interested in being a future release manager, please talk to me here or send me an email or something. Um, and uh, we'll go from there on that. Thank you.